Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we're going to get started with breathing mindfulness meditation to start our afternoon session off. We're not going to be doing loving kindness this afternoon, just the breathing mindfulness meditation. So you guys have done that with me many times. So we're going to start with the chanting, ease into that, and then I'll provide you some guidance and then there'll be a period of time where it'll just be quiet and then we'll come out with the chanting as well. So if you'd like to join along for the meditation, you're welcome to. And then afterwards, I'm going to be sharing this topic of cultivating healthy mental states, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. This is where you're going to learn about how to remedy the mind's symptoms with certain aspects of these particular healthy mental states that are going to help you to cultivate certain qualities that you're going to need on your journey towards enlightenment. So if you'd like to join for the chanting and the meditation, feel free. Arahang samasamutoy makwa, huwatang makwa nang apiwati yami, Savakato Mahakavata Dhammo Dhamang Namasami Supatipano Mahakavato Savaka Sanko Sanghang Namami Napmur Hasab Hakavato Arato Samasamputasa Napmur hasab hakewato Arato sama samputasa Napmur hasab hakewato Arato sama samputasa Iti piso emakewa Arahang sama samoto we cha cha ranang samuno Sakato roka vito Anu tero purisa Dama sati sata tawa manu sanang Oto pakewati Okay, with the lower body and hands and arms comfortable in closing the eyes, just start breathing in through the nose and out through the nose. Here you're just looking to establish the breath. A nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. Not forced or controlled, just a gradual inhale through the nose Developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then whenever you're ready, exhale out through the nose. Experiencing the full breath. Breathing in. And out. Breathing in and out.
Your breath may not match up with the guidance that I'm providing, and that's okay. This is your practice. I'm just here for guidance. You can use this voice as a reminder that whenever you get to the next inhale, breathe in gradually through the nose, developing a nice, natural, steady, consistent breath. And then when you're ready, exhale out through the nose, experiencing the full breath. Breathing in, and out. Breathing in, and out. With the breath well established, Start fixating the mind on the breath, either the sound of the breath coming into the nose or the sensation of air moving over the skin into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. and out. Breathing in and out. With the mind fixated on the breath, Whenever you notice that it moves off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. Whenever you notice that the mind is moved off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath the present moment. Breathing in and out. Breathing in and out. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work of focusing on the breath, cutting off and letting go any time the mind moves off the breath. You have nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time to focus on the breath. Breathing in and out.
to slowly make your way out of meditation. Okay, this afternoon's topic is cultivating healthy mental states, loving kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy, and equanimity. Here's where you're going to learn the four healthy mental states that you'll need to cultivate as you train your mind and cultivate these wholesome qualities that are then going to help you to bring into place your harmonious relationships. Without this particular teaching, you wouldn't be able to produce harmonious relationships. I'm going to walk you through each of these individual uh, Brahma Viharas and then help you to understand what the symptoms are if you're not practicing these so that when you see those symptoms, you can then bring in the appropriate Brahma Vihara that you need in order to remedy that symptom until you fully cultivate these particular healthy mental states. You're going to still experience certain symptoms as a result of not having practiced these. And this is where the Buddha gets the reputation of oftentimes being like a doctor because there's certain prescriptions and then there's a, uh, I'm sorry, there's certain symptoms and then there's a certain prescription that is applied in order to help remedy the particular issue. This term Brahma Vihara, where it comes from is the word Brahma during the lifetime of the Buddha, it means God and Vihara means dwelling. So the Brahman priest or the Hindu priest were teaching the Brahma Viharas. They were teaching this is the way to dwell with God. This is the way to be in union with God or closer to God. The Buddha didn't teach it that way. It's referred to as the Brahma Viharas. He taught them as healthy mental states in order to antidote certain aspects of the mind, eliminating certain symptoms. But at least you'll know the origins of this particular word, Brahma Vihara, because sometimes you'll hear people talk about it as like, the abode of God or dwelling with God or something like that. Uh, So the 
purpose of these healthy mental states are to cultivate wholesome qualities that are going to antidote certain symptoms in your mind. The first one here is called loving kindness. So I'm going to explain to you what it is, then I'll explain to you the symptoms, and then I'll explain to you how to cultivate it. So what loving kindness is, is active goodwill towards all beings without judgment, that you have active goodwill towards others. The reason why I say without judgment is because sometimes we're taught like, don't respect them until they respect you. You might have been taught this growing up, that don't respect them until they respect you. Well, if everybody was practicing that, nobody would be respecting anybody because everybody would be waiting for everyone else to respect each other. And then as soon as somebody started respecting somebody, then the others would start respecting that person. Well, that's very unwise. When you're trying to move to this enlightened mental state and you're trying to move to this higher consciousness, you're gonna take need to take the initiative and the effort and the energy to put forth the certain wholesome quality that you're trying to practice. If you're gonna not practice generosity until somebody else practices generosity with you, this means that your mind has craving, desire, attachment. You have a certain expectation. If you're not going to respect others until they respect you, then that means that your respect is contingent. It's dependent. It's attached to something. You have a certain expectation. And the same thing is true if you have loving kindness where you're expecting somebody else to be loving and kind first before you are loving and kind. This isn't the way an enlightened being functions. You need to be loving and kind regardless, right? Because what you put out is going to come back to you. So you're not interested in judging other people to determine if they deserve your loving kindness or not. You just practice loving kindness with everybody, anybody and everybody. You practice loving kindness with them. So you have this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, this active goodwill. What this is antidoting is it's antidoting the unwholesome qualities of anger, hatred, ill will, and all those lesser versions like frustration, irritation, annoyance, dislike, even the slightest little dislike. By the time you get to enlightenment, you have loving kindness for all beings. You won't even have the slightest dislike towards others. So this is what you're antidoting. The way that you're cultivating this is through loving kindness meditation in practicing loving kindness in daily life. You're gonna to need to cultivate your mindfulness and awareness of mind so that when you see the anger, the hatred, the ill will, the frustration, the irritation, the agitation, the annoyance, the dislike, when you see those things coming up in the mind, you're gonna to need to know, aha, bring in the loving kindness. This is what I need to bring in, right? Say you're sitting at a park and you're looking at somebody across and you start noticing this frustration that maybe you don't like the way they look, you don't like the way that they're interacting in the world. Maybe you don't like the sound of their voice. Any number of things that you might not like about this person. That's your own cravings, desires, attachments. That's a reflection of what's going on in your own mind. That's not a reflection of what's going on with them. That's a reflection of what's going on in your mind. That you're judging this person and you're having certain cravings of what you want that person to be. And when they're not meeting your cravings, your frustration or your agitation or your dislike is arising. So there's where you need to bring in the loving kindness. Just have a genuine interest in seeing them be well. Whatever they choose, that's what they choose. Part of having loving kindness or love for all beings is to understand that everybody needs to make their own decisions. You enjoy it when you make your own decisions. You enjoy that. If somebody tried to force you or control you to do any particular thing, you wouldn't like that very much. And you wouldn't enjoy that kind of world where people are constantly going around and trying to force each other to do certain things. So where you see your mind is judging others and wanting other people to be a certain way, putting your expectations on them, the opposite of that is having loving kindness for them, where you have a genuine interest in seeing them be well, and that is love without any expectations of trying to want them or control them to be any particular way. So it's your loving kindness meditation and practicing loving kindness in daily life through your intention, speech, and actions that's going to help you to bring this into the mind. And you're going to need to have that mindfulness or awareness of mind to see when you're angry, frustrated, irritated, annoyed, or any of these other discontent feelings to then apply right effort to cut that off and eliminate it and bring in the loving kindness. Okay, so this is how you cultivate this. Then there's uh, compassion. What compassion is, is the concern for the misfortune of others. This is the middle way. 
the craving side of this, which is not what you're interested in, is where you have worry and you have anxiety about the world. You worry about what's going on in the world. You see that a lot of people died over the Sangran holiday due to tra traffic accidents, and maybe you worry about that. Or you see missiles and rockets are headed towards Israel, and maybe you worry about that and you have anxiety. Or you see a war going on in a place like Ukraine, maybe you worry about that and you have anxiety. That's the craving desire attachment. That's not the middle way. But the other side of that is indifference, where you could care less. You could care less what happens to people. That's the other side. You're not interested in that either. You would like to come to the middle where you practice compassion, where you have concern for these beings' welfare. You have concern for their misfortune, but you understand that their misfortune is based on their decisions. They need to make decisions that are going to improve the results of what they're experiencing. And you don't have the ability to make decisions for everybody in the world. Everybody in the world is making their own decisions. So when you bring your mind to the middle with compassion, this will help you eliminate the worry and anxiety that the mind has about the world. This is where the Buddha was teaching yesterday when we were reading Right Mindfulness, where he says, having put aside craving and worry for the world. If you guys remember that part where I was reading that for you guys from the Buddhist teachings, that's what you need to do is you need to put aside your craving and worry for the world, holding on to the world, wanting the world to be a certain way. The world is functioning based on these natural laws of existence. It's functioning that way all the time, whether people are aware of it or not. And you can't control what happens in the world. You can only control what happens in your own life. So where you see your mind's worry or having anxiety, you bring in the compassion. Or if you see your mind is indifferent and you could care less about what happens to people, that's where you bring in the compassion. You have concern for their misfortune, right? A worried mind sees all the problems in the world and it's discontent. But a concerned mind sees the solutions and it can maintain its contentedness because there's just concern. The solutions for the world is to practice these teachings. If everybody practiced these teachings, we wouldn't have wars. We wouldn't have famine. We wouldn't have disease and illness the way that we do in some parts of the world. We wouldn't have all the difficulties and struggles, but each individual needs to decide to do that on their own. We can't force other people to practice these teachings. They have to decide for themselves that that's what they would like to do. So the way that you cultivate this compassion is through practicing mindfulness where you're aware of your mind. And whenever you see these unwholesome qualities of indifference, worry, or anxiety, you then apply right effort to bring in the compassion. Usually loving kindness and compassion go together really well. So as you're practicing loving kindness meditation and practicing loving kindness in daily life, you'll probably notice more compassion arising, but you're going to need to actively bring in the compassion. When you use your mindfulness to see the indifference, the worry and anxiety, then you'll know like, ah, I'm worried about the world. I'm craving for the world to be a certain way. Let me bring that over to the middle where I just have concern or, ah, I'm indifferent and I could care less about what happens to those people. Well, that's not where you're interested in being either. Even if it's somebody that's doing unwise things, right? Like say you know that somebody murdered 10 people and now they're being sentenced to death and maybe they're going to die in the electric chair or something like that. That's very unfortunate, right? That's unfortunate for that person. I'm not indifferent about that. I have concern for that for person, but obviously they're experiencing the results of their decisions. These are decisions that they made and they're experiencing the results of that. It's unfortunate that some places we put people to death like that, but that's the result of their decisions and that's where we are in society. But I'm not indifferent to that, but I'm also not worried about that either. That's what's happening now and I don't have any control or ability to change that, right? So you'll need to bring your mind to the middle where you see these unwise and unwholesome things happening in the world, but you don't worry and have anxiety, but you're also not indifferent to them either. Okay. Any questions on loving kindness or compassion? For those of you guys online, you can put your questions into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or in Zoom, you can raise your hand electronically and ask any questions that you like. Okay. I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So let's go on to the next two. This is sympathetic joy and equanimity. Sympathetic joy is joy for other success, even if you didn't contribute to it. This is the exact opposite of envy, jealousy, and pride, right? If you experience a situation where you're hearing from a friend or a family member or a coworker that something very fortunate is happening for them, then 
you might get jealous. You might get envious, right? If you notice that jealousy coming up, the exact opposite of that is sympathetic joy, where you have joy for their success. And the way that you're going to need to cultivate this is that with your mindfulness, your awareness of mind, when you notice the jealousy coming up, you need to bring in the sympathetic joy. So let's just say you're at work and you applied for a particular job, some promotion at work, and maybe two or three or four of your colleagues applied for the same promotion, right? And now you guys all applied, you did the interview, you're really hoping that you're going to get that new job, that new promotion, and maybe you're at your desk and you're working away on an email or something. And maybe somebody comes by and they say, hey, guess what? I got that new job. Aren't you happy? Or, or isn't that so great? Or something like that. Inside, you might actually be kind of jealous. You might have some envy, right? If you had craving to get that job yourself, you're going to have jealousy in that situation. So even though you notice with your mindfulness that you have jealousy that's in there, you're going to need to apply the effort. Even if you can just smile and say, Barbara, I'm so pleased for you. I'm so pleased for you. Even though inside you don't quite feel it because there's that craving in there that you're fighting against, you're going to need to apply right effort to arise that sympathetic joy. And as you do more and more, it'll get easier and easier for you to do it. But it, initially you could have certain challenges in certain situations. But whenever you notice envy, jealousy, or pride, this is where you'd like to bring in the sympathetic joy. And this is going to help you. Right. One of the things that the Buddha teaches you that can help you in this particular area is he teaches that anytime you see anybody experiencing any fortunate situation, he says, you've already experienced that in this life or some previous life because you've had so many previous lives. He says, you see somebody famous, rich and wealthy. You've already done that. Maybe not in this life, but in a previous life. This can help your mind to let go. Right. He also says the same thing about misfortune, too. So this can help you with compassion, that when you understand that any misfortunes that you see other people experiencing, he says you've experienced those same things either in this life or some other life. So if you see somebody homeless on the street, you're not homeless now, but maybe you're indifferent to that person's struggle. But if you can put your mind in the frame of reference of I've experienced that exact same thing at some point in this life or some previous life, this can help you arise compassion. So if you're interested in arising compassion and sympathetic joy, you can remember this teaching that anything that you see anyone experiencing that's unfortunate, you've experienced the exact same thing. So no need to judge them, no need to look down on them, but instead have concern for their misfortune. You've been able to work your way out of that misfortune, but that person hasn't yet. They're still in the process of doing that. Or if you see somebody experiencing something fortunate, maybe they get a new house, they get a raise at work, they get a new boyfriend, a new girlfriend, maybe they're going on holiday or something like that. The Buddha says you've experienced this same thing at some point in the past. And something that will help you to cultivate loving kindness that the Buddha teaches is he teaches you that anybody that you come in contact with today, he says at some point in your previous lives, this person has been either your mother, your father, your brother, your sister, your son, your daughter, or some other relative. Essentially, what he teaches is that we're all family, that we all have been family members at some point. So maybe when we were lizards, we were brothers, right? Or maybe you were my dad when I was a snake or something like that, right? This is what the Buddha teaches you. And if you put this in your mind and you think this way, this will change your perspective when you go out into the world. So rather than think about people as a stranger, because we're taught that strangers are bad, this is what the mind's been conditioned to believe. Instead, just think that, hey, this is a family member I haven't met yet. That's all this is. This is a family member I haven't met yet. So there's no harm in talking to this person that I don't know. It's just a family member that I haven't met yet. And if you start speaking Thai, what you'll notice is here in Thailand, when we go out to restaurants and we go out in public places, we actually refer to people by certain things like this. So like if I'm at a restaurant and there's an older lady behind the restaurant or she's helping me, I'll talk to her as she's my mom or my grandmother, or like when we went out to lunch just now, there was the waiters, and when I was calling them for the check, I called them little brother. I said, little brother, can you bring me the check? Right, and that's what I said in Thai, right? So we actually refer to each other as little brother, little sister, older brother, older sister, mom, dad, uncle, aunt, all these kinds of things. Even if you see little kids, you, you talk to them as if they are your own kid. 
right? So the Buddha teaches this as part of his teachings that we've all been family members at some point in the past. This can help you shift your perspective away from thinking of people as a stranger and it's somebody that you shouldn't get along with or somebody that means harm to you or something like that. You can shift your perspective and just think about it as this is a family member that you haven't met yet. And now you can feel free to talk to anybody and everybody that you interact with. This can be very helpful for you in your relationships. And it'll help you to arise loving kindness, compassion, and sympathetic joy. Okay? And then this equanimity. What this equanimity is, is this is mental calmness, composure, evenness of temper, especially in a difficult situation. That's one side of it. The other side of it is treating everyone impartially. But let me explain both sides. The equanimity is this calmness, composure, this evenness of temper, especially in a difficult situation. So for example, say you get a phone call that your mom has been in a terrible car accident and they're rushing her across town in an ambulance to the hospital. Well, when you get this news, your mind might be all shaken up by that, but that's not actually helping anything. When your mind's all shaken up like that, you might grab your keys to your car or your motorbike and you might run across town and make all kinds of unwise decisions and you might get in a car accident yourself right? This would be very unwise to do that. At the very least, you're going to show up to the hospital with your mind all shaken up. And now the doctors and nurses are going to be trying to talk to you so that you can make decisions that's going to help your mom. And you're not going to be able to do that because your mind's all shaken up. So the Buddha teaches you equanimity so that you can maintain your calmness and composure so that you can make wise decisions, especially in a difficult situation. So in a situation where you get a phone call that your mom has been in a terrible car accident, you're not going to help her by racing across town, right? She's in the best hands she could be in. She's in the back of an ambulance with an emergency medical technicians. She's about to arrive to a hospital with doctors and nurses and equipment that can take care of her. You rushing across town isn't going to help anything. What you would like to do is ensure that when you show up to the hospital, that your mind is such that it can be calm and composed so that now you can listen to what the nurses and the doctors have to say, and now you can make wise decisions that's actually going to help her, right? So when you have a calm mind, you will have mindfulness or awareness of mind. When you have awareness of mind or mindfulness, you will then have concentration. And when you have concentration, you can access your wisdom. And now you can make wise decisions that are going to produce wholesome results in your life. An enlightened being can make wise decisions all day long, and they're only ever experiencing wholesome results. But when your mind's shaken up, when it's uncalm, you don't have mindfulness or awareness of mind. You don't have concentration and therefore you can't access your wisdom. So this is why you might grab your keys and run across town and try to hurry up and get to the hospital because you're making unwise decisions because you're not accessing your wisdom. And this is where the situation can become worse. So by maintaining your calmness and composure, especially in difficult situation, this will help you to produce wholesome results. So this is why, what, like if there's an earthquake or a fire or a tornado or some kind of natural event like that, the first thing they teach you is remain calm, calmly make your way to the door, right? Because if you hurriedly do these things, you're going to make unwise decisions and it's going to produce unwholesome results. So by maintaining your calmness and composure, you'll be able to access your wisdom and make wise decisions to produce wholesome results. Then the other part of equanimity is treating people impartially, meaning treating everyone fairly, right? Like you would like to treat everybody fairly, treat everybody equally. So for example, if I'm going to bring a milkshake to work and share it with one of my coworkers, and I've bought one for myself and I bought one for my coworker, the other coworkers, they're going to get jealous, right? They're not on the path right? They don't, they have craving, desire, attachment. Now they're going to experience painful feelings and they're going to attribute those painful feelings to me. And now they're going to push me away. And now they're going to be bitter and harsh and hostile. So the Buddha is teaching you how to get along with unenlightened beings in the world. So if you treat everyone impartially, that means if I'm going to bring a milkshake for Barbara, I need to bring one for Bob, David, Rebecca, and Susie too right? And then now I treat everybody equally. I give everybody a milkshake or I bring everybody some bagels or everybody some donuts or something like that. Whereas if you just brought it for one particular person, this is going to promote difficulties in your relationships. You're not going to be able to have harmonious relationships or say that you are a boss and say you're 
going to give someone a raise or give someone a, a bonus, or you're going to take one of your employees out to lunch or something like that. You're going to need to treat everybody equally because otherwise your other employees are going to get jealous. And now this is going to promote difficulties in your relationships. You're going to have a hard time conducting yourself at work. Or if you have children, you're going to need to treat them equally, right? If you treat one child one way and another child another way, it's going to promote division and separation in your household. So this other part of equanimity, the root word of equanimity is equal, where you treat everyone equally. Okay. So the way that you, or, or the remedy of, for this is it's actually remedying restlessness, worry, anxiety, and an overactive mind. Okay. So that's the calmness and composure part. It's remedying the restlessness, worry, anxiety, and overactive mind. The treating everyone impartially is helping you to eliminate any kind of arrogance or ego in the mind, because sometimes you might be trying to treat other people special because you yourself might think that your mind is special and now you need to treat other people in a special way. But instead, you'd like to treat everybody equally, right? Everybody fairly. So the way that you cultivate this is the same the way. It's through right mindfulness and right effort. Wherever you see your mind with mindfulness being shaken up and having restlessness or overactivity, you're going to need to bring in the calmness and the composure. Where you see that you're potentially going to treat people impartially and unfairly, you would like to bring in the fairness and treat everybody equally. I'll give you an example from my life. I was at my son's previous school and all the parents kind of gather outside the gate waiting for the children to come out of school. And there's a new principal there that started about a year and a half ago. And uh, they have kind of this rule that you're supposed to wear this ID badge in order to pick up your child so they know who you are and that you're getting your child. Well, some parents wear them, some parents don't, right? Because of impermanence, not everybody's going to wear them. But the school, they have a craving for everybody to wear their ID badge. So the principal comes out and sees that there's several people not wearing their ID badge, and she makes an announcement that everybody needs to get their ID badge, and if they don't get their ID badge, you can't pick up your child. And if you don't have your ID badge, you need to go to the office show your ID, get a visitor badge, and then pick up your child. And then she looks over at me because I didn't have my ID badge on. She looks over at me and she says, I know you, you don't have to go do that. You're okay to pick up your child. But these other people had to go do that, right? That's what she was trying to tell them to do. This is not equanimity. This is not treating everyone fairly. In my opinion, if you're going to practice these teachings, you need to treat everyone fairly. I should have been told to go get my ID badge too, right? It shouldn't have been like these people are treated one way and these people are treated another way. This is favoritism and this isn't looked upon favorably. So if you're in an environment like that or you're implementing some type of thing in your life, whether it's a family thing or a professional thing, you would like to treat everybody fairly where you're not doing one thing thing that's special for one group of people and one thing that's special for another group of people because you'd like everybody to feel that you're treating them fairly and equally and this will promote more harmonious relationships for you and it makes it easier for you too that if you have one special way to treat one group of people and the other group of people get treated a different way this is a lot more challenging for you to manage whereas if you just treat everybody the same it's really straightforward and really easy okay so this is equanimity you're going to need right mindfulness and right effort in order to bring this into practice so any questions on this you guys online you're welcome to ask questions as well no questions okay well as i thought we're finishing up early this afternoon this is a very short topic to teach is four healthy mental states that you guys will need to learn about and dial them in closer and closer, understanding the symptoms and the remedies and then how to cultivate them in your mind. Okay. So tomorrow what we're going to be doing is, um, oh, I didn't teach this one, but I've taught this to you in other classes. This is generosity. It's not one of the Brahma Viharas, but generosity is a healthy mental state as well. And I include this in this chapter. This is chapter 14. I talk about generosity in there and explaining to you how this is going to cultivate 
uh, wholesome qualities in your mind to eliminate selfishness. It's not considered one of the Brahma Viharas, but generosity is a healthy mental state that you're going to need to cultivate. And oftentimes people find this very challenging in their life to cultivate generosity, to give and share without any expectation of anything in return. But this is something that you're going to need to cultivate as well. Okay. So tomorrow, uh, in the morning, we're going to start with loving kindness meditation, just like we did this morning. And then I'm going to teach you true love, love without attachment. This will really help you to understand where you might be misunderstanding craving, desire, attachment as love. And this will help you get closer and closer to harmonious relationships. And then afterwards, I'm going to teach you practicing in the world of the unknowing relationships with non-practitioners. So your parents may not be practicing these teachings, your brothers and sisters, your life partner, perhaps. So I'm going to teach you how to practice in a world where people aren't practicing. And then in the afternoon, we'll talk about sharing the path to enlightenment, how to guide children along the path, whether you have children or whether you have nieces or nephews, or whether you just have friends and family that you would like to share these teachings with, this will actually help you as part of that. So thank you all for coming today and deciding you'd like to learn the teachings of the Buddha. Thank you for those of you guys online. Thank you for your questions. And perhaps we'll see you guys in a future class. Okay. Be well and have a lovely rest of your day. Sawadee again for watching enjoy your meditation look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have thank you so much